Hello and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays from the Deep Carbon Observatory. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of DCO's engagement team based at the University of Rhode Island. This webinar is brought to you by Engagement and DCO's Synthesis Group 2019. Today's webinar is the second in a series focused on synthesizing science, in which we're highlighting some of DCO's synthesis projects. The goal of DCO's synthesis effort is to bring together 10 years of deep carbon science and share what our scientific community has learned and what remains unknown and perhaps unknowable about the quantities, movements, forms, and origins of carbon in Earth. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenters who led and took part in the Earth in Five Reactions project. Dr. Jackie Lee is an experimental geochemist and mineral physicist at the University of Michigan, who has spent more than two decades studying material properties at extreme pressures and temperatures and investigating the thermal and chemical evolution history of Earth and other terrestrial planetary bodies. Dr. Simon Redfern is a mineral scientist at the University of Cambridge who has worked on a broad range of deep carbon related research, including the behavior of carbonate minerals in the deep earth and the use of diamonds as a laboratory tool for the study of materials at extreme conditions. Dr. Donato Giovanelli is a microbial ecologist at the University of Naples and his research focuses on the metabolic and taxonomic diversity of prokaryotes in different geothermally influenced marine ecosystems and the emergence and evolution of early metabolism. And finally, Dr. Jennifer Glass, who is a biogeochemist at Georgia Tech, who studies the anaerobic oxidation of methane, biogeochemical cycles of bioessential trace elements, and the coevolution of microbial metabolisms and ocean chemistry over Earth history, among other things. The Earth in Five Reactions Project, or E5R for short, set out to identify the five reactions central to establishing Earth as a living planet. Having done so through a community-wide survey and two-day workshop, participants in the project are now using the reactions to synthesize 10 years of deep carbon science to give a new perspective on how the planet works. Today, Jackie and Simon will lead us through the five finalists for Earth in Five Reactions. Or is it eight? We'll find out. And then we'll talk to all the panelists about the project, how it has unfolded, and what we can expect to see in the coming months. Before I hand over the mic to Jackie, a few bits of housekeeping. The presentation portion of the webinar will last about 10 minutes, and then we'll go into an interview portion. If you have any questions you'd like to ask our panel, please type them into the chat, and we'll address them in the interview section. The chat is also where you'll find a couple of useful links, including a link to the E5R webpage and the Haiku website. So with that, I'm pleased to sign off and turn it over to Jackie. Hi, I'm Jackie. The Earth in Five Reactions project began in 2017. The goal of the E5R is to synthesize deep carbon science research across disciplines and communities, and also to make the product appealing to broader audiences outside of the DCO community. We are now entering the final phase of the project where we are disseminating what we have learned. In today's seminar, we will go through the reactions we identified as vital to a habitable planet and why we and the participants in our workshop chose them. So we aimed for Earth in five reactions, but we had three very strong runners up as well. So don't be alarmed that we are talking about eight reactions today. The three runners ups are particularly near and dear to me because they take place deep in Earth in the lower mantle and the core, and also the deep part of the upper mantle. So in this figure, we are showing in blue the three runners up reactions, and I'm going to go through them one by one. One of the runners up reaction is the solidification of a molten iron carbon alloy on the left hand side to produce a solid iron carbide and a residual carbon, iron carbon alloy liquid with less carbon on the right hand side. This reaction may be responsible for the growth of a carbide rich inner core, which would be the most carbon rich layer in the Earth. So the solid inner core of the Earth is a sphere of 1200 kilometers radius. It plays a very important role in regulating the Earth's magnetic field, 
which in turn is crucial for keeping the ocean and atmosphere and sustaining life on, uh, on Earth. The second runners-up reaction converts carbon in metal and iron oxide component in silicate into carbonate component in silicate and iron metal. This reaction describes the partitioning of carbon during the segregation of Earth's iron-rich core from its silicate mantle. Because carbon is highly siderophile, as shown in the partitioning experiment, and is highly incompatible in mantle minerals, this reaction would scavenge most of Earth's carbon into the core, making it by far the largest reservoir of carbon in Earth. In the third runners-up reaction, magnesite, a magnesium carbonate, is reduced by iron metal to produce elemental carbon and an oxide. Many people know that 99% of the diamonds found on Earth's surface come from the base of the lithosphere at about 140 kilometers down to the Earth. A small fraction of the diamonds may originate from hundreds of kilometers inside the Earth. They are known as super deep diamonds. This reaction proposed here may produce iron, has been proposed as a candidate mechanism to make diamonds in deep mantle. Moreover, the reaction may produce iron carbon alloy, which could be brought to the core mantle boundary through mantle convection, leading to extreme carbon sequestration. So I've introduced the three runners upper reactions. Now I'm going to hand the mic over to Simon, who is going to talk about the five winners. Thank you, Jackie. So now we come to the, uh, the winners. So Jackie's described the three runners up, uh, which are all to do with the, the deep solid earth. And the winners from a, sort of a poll of scientists who gathered to think about uh, the work of the Deep Carbon Observatory and where, where we felt the most important carbon-based reactions were occurring uh, are listed here. And these are all chemical reactions that uh, initially, sometimes some of them don't actually appear to have anything to do with carbon, but um, I hope to show that they all actually do. So the first one here, hydrogenation, dehydrogenation, is an important reaction potentially for the origin of life. And it can occur in a number of places on Earth. So this uh, image here is actually from one of the postcards that came from the, um, the engagement group at the end of the DCO uh, project at, for Earth in five reactions. And the hydrogenation dehydrogenation reaction, it's the reaction that produces methane from CO2 and uh, hydrogen. So if you look here at the middle of these three uh, CO2 hydrogenation reactions, it's catalyzed in this case by nickel. So what we have coming in from the left CO2 and hydrogen going out on the right methane or methane. Uh, this is the reaction that occurs uh, by, uh, in a number of extremophile bacteria in uh, very, very simple organisms, archaea, that have been around uh, since the origins of life on Earth. And this reaction is interesting because it's one possible route to creating the individual molecules that uh, then come together to form networks and then cells and then from those individual cells, organisms. So one approach to thinking about the origin of life is that it is a consequence of these sorts of uh, compounds that are formed uh, from simple reactions such as this. This reaction occurs in the deep biosphere. It, it occurs in rocks within uh, the subsurface. It occurs on Mars. Uh, the organisms that, that actually use this reaction to generate energy and, and to live uh, exist at high temperatures and high pressures, some of them at extreme uh, values of pH, extremely alkaline conditions, and potentially also on other planets like Mars. So simply because this is the reaction that could be responsible for the origin of life, it's clearly an important 
uh, carbon-based reaction. The next one I want to talk about that came out on the list is carboxylation. And this is the underlying re reaction behind the process of photosynthesis. So obviously it's very important to us today on, on the, the, the modern Earth and pretty much since uh, the origins of life in the oceans and then the movement of, of the biosphere onto the continents in the Devonian time, about 500 million years ago, this reaction has been going on to generate oxygen in the atmosphere and to generate uh, sugars from a combination of water plus CO2. So it's an important reaction in controlling atmospheric chemistry, but it's also an important reaction in generating uh, energy. The next reaction we come to is carbonation and decarbonation. Again, it sounds a bit similar to carboxylation, but it's not quite the same. It's the reaction of CO2 with uh, calcium silicate to form calcium carbonate and silica, it's shown in, in, in this reaction. That's going that way, going from left to right, and starting with CO2 and a, and a silicate mineral to produce a carbonate mineral and silica, is a way of drawing carbonate into the earth, drawing CO2 into the earth from the atmosphere. This is actually the process by which the slow carbon cycle on earth works. It's the way that the earth can regulate atmospheric CO2 over geological timescales. Going in the other direction, it's a metamorphic reaction. So we could have, for example, a limestone plus a sand quartz forming uh, a metamorphic mineral plus CO2. So the formation of mountains in, in metamorphism can actually also generate CO2 as a source into the atmosphere. So it can operate in both directions. Uh, when it's operating as silicate weathering, we, we've actually been able to see this occurring uh, within organisms uh, in the oceans on Earth, and we can see the sort of time scales that it operates on. So this is uh, a, a, an excursion. This, these graphs here show an excursion in CO2, atmospheric CO2 that occurred around 55 million years ago, and it's picked out in the chemistry of some of the shells that formed in marine organisms at the time. And you can see that there was this extreme increase in CO2 at the time that then came back to the background value. And it came back to the background value, really it's thought because of this reaction, that the CO2 was sucked back into the earth. Uh, it's kind of relevant to today because today we're run, living through an extreme CO2 excursion uh, through burning fossil fuels. And I think uh, it's interesting to look at the time scale of this reaction on Earth. The time scale is of the order of 100,000 years. So it's not quite quick enough uh, to combat CO2 uh, rises in the, in the atmosphere that we have today. Although it could be used uh, in combination with things like mine wastes to bring down CO2 uh, to negative carbon emissions uh, through sort of geoengineering mechanisms. The next reaction I want to talk about is CO2 dissolution and outgassing. This is what you see when you open your can of soda, so your, your can of Pepsi or Coke outgasses CO2 when it uh, depressurizes. So the CO2 is in there at high pressure and it comes out when you open the can or you open the lid of the bottle. And that's coming out because the pressure changes and the same happens uh, in volcanism. So whenever there's volcanism going on, uh, the, the liquid rock that comes to the surface uh, depressurizes, and as it depressurizes, all the gas that's dissolved in it uh, comes out into the atmosphere. So here we've got an example of a volcanic eruption of us. Actually, this is myself, but next to a lava flow, uh, able to see in Iceland. And you can see there were huge plumes of gas coming out of this volcanic eruption, uh, much of which was water, but some was CO2. And then the final reaction that we come to uh, is hydration or dehydration. Uh, and we're not talking simply about dehydration or hydration of your skin uh, with, with hydration products, although it's similar, but the interaction of CO2 with water. And the interaction of CO2 with water produces this material here, which is carboxylic acid. This is an, an acid that uh, is then dissolved into the water 
and makes the water more acid. It's, it's, uh, it, it's sometimes known as acid rain when it occurs in, in clouds, but it, it's also the main process by which ocean acidification happens as CO2 in the atmosphere increases. But this also can occur in the presence of, so we've got CO2 and water here, but in the presence of other minerals. So these complicated things here, this is um, uh, uh, the mineral olivine, this is, uh, this is an iron silicate mineral. If you have these present as well, then what you can produce is this uh, rather complicated looking uh, compound here, which is actually a mineral called serpentine. And this happens throughout the oceanic crust. And it's, it forms this snakeskin-like um, rock, which is serpentinite, so-called so because it looks like a snake. So this hydration reaction of uh, silicate mineral, silicate olivine, also produces methane. So if we go back, you can see that the methane is produced here. It's a, another route to producing methane, but in this case, uh, via a, an abiotic, an inorganic process. So in summary, those were the five reactions that were voted upon uh, when we gathered together to consider uh, Earth's, Earth in five reactions. Uh, we have methanogenesis, illustrated here by the cow. Uh, we have photosynthesis, illustrated by this palm tree. Uh, silicate weathering and metamorphism. Outgassing of CO2, as you would get from, in this case, uh, ginger ale. And hydration and dehydration, as occurs in the oceanic crust. So with that, I think we come to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Jackie. Um, if I could just um, ask Jackie, Simon and Donato and Jen to please turn their cameras and microphones back on. Um, and a reminder to our audience members, um, if you have a question during this interview section, please just type it in the chat window and I will um, ask it of our presenters. So Jackie, I wanted to start with you. Um, the deep earth reactions or the runners up, um, they were particularly near and dear to your heart. Why do you think they didn't make the top five in the end? That's a very good question. I have thought about that a lot because I was very surprised when the vote came in and then we saw none of the five reactions made to the top five. We have lined up people to advocate for those reactions. And uh, lots of people expressed how they are interested or convinced that these reactions are important, but the vote showed that uh, they are only runners up. I think it has to do with people resisting things they're not familiar with. Uh, so all the people at the workshop, they know about the shallow reactions, but only the deeper people, they they kind of thought about the deep reactions more um, carefully or more, more just to thought about them more. So when we come to a democratic vote, the, the votes of the other reactions, they also, they were listed first. So all the votes already were given to those reactions and everybody is only allowed to vote for five. We also even thought about maybe we have to vote it again to go through a more um, kind of a, careful, prudent procedure, but in the end, I think what it shows is the shallow reactions. People just have known them for a long time, that they appreciate the importance more. And then it's a challenge and it's also our goal to try to make people see the deep reactions more deeply. So you, you just touched on the, the setup of this workshop that came after a big survey of the DCO community. Um, so that meant that everyone went into the workshop kind of with an idea of what more of the most important reactions might be. Simon, how about you? Did you go in kind of with a favorite? Um, Do you think it was a front runner going in? Well, I, I, I was surprised that Diamond didn't make it there, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, Diamond, I would have thought, was everybody's best friend. But um, the, the, I... I, I Taking Jackie's comments a little further, I think one of the interesting things is the top two reactions are both to do with life. And uh, I think there's a big human bias in this, uh, unsurprisingly, in, in this democratic vote. 
because we all believe that life's important. I mean, that's kind of uh, a big motivator for everybody. So the origins of life, hydrogenation and dehydrogenation, clearly uh, came out top because everyone wants to understand how life began. And photosynthesis is obviously clearly important to make life, to make life on Earth uh, possible, to make Earth a habitable planet. So in a way, it's not utterly surprising that we have these sorts of biases. But of course, as geologists, as, as, as mineralogists, myself and, and Jackie, we kind of felt that the things like diamonds and the Earth's core were surely the most important thing. But it goes to show you can't trust, can't trust your colleagues to, to agree with you. <laughs> uh, Donato, as a microbiologist, you know, do you have a response to these <laughs> comments? Well, I think a portion of it was also how the question was framed. The question was, what are the most important reactions that make Earth habitable? And arguably, and you know, life makes and keeps also the planet habitable. So if you want to think about something that is completely different from any other planet we know, life comes up. And I think that's one of the reasons for which we got a big response of life-related reaction. There's also something else to be, um, to be said, I think, is that if you think the other reaction, hydration, dehydration, hydrogenation, carboxylation, all of these can be related to life in one way or another. You think about hydration, you think about serpentinization, if you think like a geologist, you think about polymerization of protein, if you think like a biologist. So in this case, depending the angle you're approaching some of the other reaction, you can see more a gel side or a bio side to it, which I think is interesting because it shows the deep link that thinking about reaction across discipline can create in discussing across different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Um, Jen, I, I want to come to you and maybe make this even harder. Um, so we had a tough time getting down to five reactions. What about just getting down to one? If you could select one reaction that's critical to the habil habitability of Earth, which one would it be? Okay, so I think this is a very hard question, obviously, and I think... Um, I have to say, it depends on when in Earth history we're talking about, <laughs> because I think that the answer to that question has changed over time. So in, uh, in terms of habitability in particular, so I think early in Earth's history, I think, say, four billion years ago, uh, and even the whole first half of Earth's history, I think I might say uh, hydrogenation. I might argue for methanogenesis, specifically at biological methanogenesis, because that actually, that greenhouse effect, we think of biological methanogenesis kept um, the earth from being completely iced over uh, and enabled life to evolve um, in the first half of its history. Then after, you know, the great oxidation event, and even for the great oxidation event to occur, I think then we have a changeover. And then I would argue it's um, carboxylation and production of oxygen and also um, organic matter, which is what we're eating right now. So if we took away all the carboxylation right now, right, at least in plants, let's say all the plants, you know, all the photosynthesis stopped, right, we would actually starve first and then we would suffocate. So those, that would be pretty bad in terms of the human viewpoint of habitability. Of course, microbes would probably be fine for a while. I just have one more thing to say is uh, about the arguing for the deep um, reactions. So I guess I'm a shallow person <laughs> myself mostly, but uh, at the workshop, I did learn a lot more about the importance of these, these deep uh, reactions in the core with carbon for possibly even maintaining you know, circulation and influencing the circulation of the, the outer core, which in turn creates the magnetosphere. And one could argue if that really is the only thing on Earth that, that could produce the magnetosphere, and that's the argument, is it? But, you know, on other planets, there's other ways of doing it. But if that really is, and if the Earth didn't have a magnetosphere, you know, a lot of life would be in a lot of trouble. Uh, it would be hard to maintain an atmosphere and even the oceans, maybe. So that's what I've got. <laughs> How about um, you, Jackie and Simon? Do you, I mean, if you had to pick one of these reactions, to be the most important, do you have one that you would go for? 
what Jen made a really good point, it depends on time. And that actually goes back to how this project got started. So sependentization was the claim that was the most important reaction in the universe, somebody said, but maybe it should be a frame as in the solar system and attributing to uh, uh, Craig Manning at UCLA. So I would think before the Earth cr accreted, sependentization might be happening in the solar system already and might be responsible for making um, organic molecules. And after the Earth is there, I would think a core formation would be the first one to maybe sequester a lot of carbon into the core and setting the stage for the evolution of life following that. So that would be my bias. I think the um, the outcome of this process is in, is incredibly interesting because when I first studied geology many, many moons ago, um, subjects were split up. It, the subject was split up into, into little, little sub-disciplines. So we had paleontology, we had you know, igneous, igneous petrology, um, metamorphic petrologies, and, and, it, and these people didn't really talk to each other very much. Um, I think what's clear is the Earth is a, is a, a complex system. And, and I think the, the results of these, uh, this survey actually illustrate that, that, that and, and, and some of the comments we've heard this evening or this afternoon, that, that um, these, these reactions occur in different places in different ways and they affect each other. And so the, the reason that Earth is a habitable planet is because of a number of interactions and actually to try and break it down into one may be a bit futile. I mean, there, there are all sorts of things going on. And at the moment, we think maybe one is critical to form uh, life on a planet. Maybe, I think Jen's made the good, the good argument for methanogenesis as being really important, but we could also say, as, as Jackie points out, that you can generate methane abiotically, and that could be the beginning of, of life as well. So I think that the fascinating thing about Earth is, and, and, and what we learn from it, is just how complex a system it is and how many interactions there are. Uh, so it's, it's maybe not the one reaction that's important, it's the fact that they all interact. Yeah. We, we've come uh, to this theme a couple of times now that um, it was very difficult to narrow down these reactions. Donata, I wanted to ask you, you know, at the workshop itself, um, you know, there was often sometimes difficulty building consensus behind the reactions. Do you think there was a particular reaction or group of reactions that it was hard to build this kind of consensus? Uh, I think actually it was the other way around, meaning that people were expecting, um, you know, probably geochemists and physicists and geologists are much better than biologists in thinking about single reaction. As biologists, typically we lump a lot of reaction together into pathways and we tend to refer to those. For example, one of the, one of the biggest voted reaction overall in the original pool was photosynthesis. But photosynthesis is not a single reaction, it's a series of reactions of complex reaction, hydration reaction, uh, carboxylation reaction. So actually the shift from thinking about pathway level group of reaction to single specific reaction they could intervene within this was very difficult to start with. And then realize that picking any single specific reaction for the surface would have been limiting led us to, to select classes of reaction. That's why right now we talk about carboxylation, decarboxylation. We don't, we don't talk about the specific carboxylation of a single molecule, of pyruvate, or 2-oxoglutarate. We talk about bio, general carboxylation, decarboxylation reaction, in the similar way we think about hydrogenation, dehydrogenation, or hydration. Uh, I think this was really hard to get to as a group, but it was very important, because uh, right now we don't have a single reaction, we have a class of reaction that describes multiple processes on the And the I think we're slowly losing Donato. Staying. <laughs> <laughs> the big surprise was hmm. the problem of being in the field. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Would anyone like to carry on where Donato just left off, or should we move to another question? I'll try to stop my video. Maybe it works better. Yeah. It sounds better. Can you, can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah. Apologies. I'm in the field in Argentina, so connection is not great down here. <laughs> I was just saying that, you know, the most difficult part of the process has been to um, realize that we were not, for many of these, for many of the voter reaction in the original poll, we were actually looking at pathways, not a single reaction, and that the mm. classes of reaction were actually the important things in li linking multiple processes on Earth. And I cannot agree more on what Simon said. The surprising part of it was understanding how single classes of reaction, actually, they can link across discipline in ways I never thought before. So, Jackie and Simon, you were involved in this project from its inception, having made it to almost the end. Are there things, if you could go back and start again, are there things that you would do differently? I wouldn't. I, I, I would be uh, loath to run it all again, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you. <laughs> great experience but yeah. it hasn't been easy <laughs> yes but, it, but it's been fun and it, it's um it's also been really educational i mean i've learned a lot and yes. uh uh so I, I it's the first time i've done something like this to 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 try and bring together lots of different ideas from a, a long project it's been going for 10 years hasn't it and and um uh, try and distill it into something that uh makes sense to a broader range of people. So that's, that's been good fun. Yeah, and on that note, um, I just want to make sure we mention that everyone should look out for the special issue of American Mineralogist that is in press right now. Um, and I also wanted to end, um, just mention a little bit some of the engagement products that we've all been working on. The postcards that you showcased in the presentation are one of them. And the other is this, Deep Earth Haiku project. Um, the link is in the chat. Jen, um, in the last few weeks, you've had your students take part in the um, Deep Earth Haiku. Could you talk a little bit about you, how you've integrated this project in the classroom? Yes, I've actually been doing it for um, a, a senior undergraduate and uh, graduate course on biogeochemical cycles. I just assigned the haiku as a online quiz and uh, they were all very happy because we had been, I had been making them write uh, <laughs> responses about seminal papers in the field, and then they got a chance to just kind of um, condense all this in a fun way, and so everybody really enjoyed it. Um, a lot of people had comments, just, oh, this is a breath of fresh air, <laughs> and I just have to read uh, a couple of them. This is on uh, outgassing. It says, Pele drinks champagne, balance deep carbon cycle, joy brings disaster. And then <laughs> on um, hydrogenation, hydrogen fuels life, protons, electrons alike, Luca's origin. So those are a few that aren't on the internet. <laughs> so. cool. Very cool. Well, we have um, reached the end. We've actually run over a little bit on time here. <laughs> So um, I'd just like to thank you all, Jackie, Simon, Donato, and Jen. This has been great. Um, and thanks to all of our audience who joined us today. We will be posting an archive of this webinar in the next few days. So if you have friends or colleagues you think would be interested, please point them to the DCO website or YouTube channel to catch up. Um, please also think about joining us in two weeks' time when we'll hear about work from the Earthbike Group at the University of Sydney. Um, who are using tectonic models to look at carbon cycling through deep time. So that's at 4 p.m. Eastern on the 6th of March. You can find more information about that and the other webinars in this series on the DCO website, which is deepcarbon.net. And as always, if you have feedback for us, you can drop us an email at engagement at deepcarbon.net. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.